Thank you, John and Richard, for joining us today to talk a little bit about Zero Trust. Uh, to kind of get this started, uh, John, would you mind just kind of walking us through what Zero Trust means to you and, and how you talk about it with, with your customers? Sure. So um, let me talk about Zero Trust uh, in the quickest I possibly can. So what is Zero Trust? Oh, the slide was already up, so I'm going to move back, please. One because it's not on my monitor. There we go. So trust, what is it? Well, trust is a human emotion that we've injected into digital systems for absolutely no reason. So it turns out that trust in digital systems is a vulnerability. And it's a very dangerous vulnerability. In fact, it's the most dangerous vulnerability in the world because it's the only vuln that's also an exploit at the same time. You don't need to create new malware for trust. All you need to do is be on the network and the bad actors can always get on the network. So the only value you get from trust in your organization uh, is that the malicious actors have a cool place to hang out. That's, all, that's the only thing it provides for you. So there's a lot of myths about zero trust. The first one is zero trust means making a system trusted. How much trust should there be in a zero trust system? I tried to make it as explicit as, as I could. Zero, we're trying to get rid of trust, not make system trusted. Trust is a joke. You can read the uh, trusted computing fact from Ross Anderson, he will tell you that. Zero trust is also not about identity. It consumes identity, but it isn't equal to identity. I can prove that with two words. Snowden, Manning, they were trusted users, they had all the right identity and MFA, but nobody looked at their packets post-authentication. And then there are zero trust products. That is not true. There are products that work well in zero trust environments, but zero trust is a strategy designed to stop data breaches and make other cybersecurity attacks unsuccessful. It's a strategy that uses products. And then zero trust is complicated, not true. There are nine things you need to know to understand and do zero trust. They look like this. The four design concepts. First, focus on the business drivers. What is your business trying to achieve? Second, design the system from the inside out. Start with the data or assets you're trying to protect. If you don't know what you're protecting, it will never work, will it? Third, determine who or what should have access to any particular resource. Need to know, least privilege, but enforce it. We've talked about least privilege forever, but we never enforced it. And then finally, you inspect and log all traffic because that's where all the bad stuff happens, in the traffic. And if we do that, we can create a layer seven policy. Ultimately, zero trust is a layer seven policy statement. Now, there is a five-step methodology that will guide your journey. The first thing you need to do is define your protect surface. I can take the attack surface and shrink it down orders of magnitude to something very small and easily known called a protect surface. What do you put in a protect surface? You put in a DAS element. It stands for data, applications, assets, or resources. Uh, so you want to protect the stuff that matters. And then you're going to see how it works as a system, map the transaction flows, and that will determine the technology that you need to protect it. So you cannot understand how to protect something until you need to know what to protect. The fourth step is to create policy. The fifth step is to monitor and maintain so that you can take all the telemetry and send it into a feedback loop and make the system stronger and stronger over time. Zero trust is an anti-fragile system. If you're familiar with anti-fragility, read the book by uh, Taleb. We can make uh, this particular system stronger and stronger over time, so you're going to break the big problem of cybersecurity in, down into multiple small problems called protect surfaces. And we can do that for OT environments all the time. And I've done it a lot. So uh, this is the quick introduction to Zero Trust. And Tony and uh, Richard and I are going to have a little discussion because we all, all have been hanging out for a while now talking Zero Trust in Cleveland, in Phoenix, for OT and all that stuff. So. Thank you for uh, letting me come and chat. Thank you, John. And we talked about zero trust. We talked a lot about the hype, the marketing buzz. Um, you know, what's the latest product? And you just talked about those myths. And, and I think one of the things that, that people struggle with is, you know, are people actually doing zero trust today? And, and can you talk about, you know, 
are you seeing zero trust applied today, and, and what does it look like? Well, there are certainly are thousands of zero trust environments. The President of the United States issued an executive order mandating all federal agencies adopt zero trust. He didn't just pick a buzzword out of the air, right? There's been a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes that I can't really talk about. But in this context for ICS, OT, IOT, whatever buzzword we're going to use, I've been building a lot of those zero trust networks starting probably 2012 was the first one I did for a big manufacturing uh, company because they couldn't solve a lot of their problems traditionally and it was the executive vice president of manufacturing who understood strategically what I was trying to do. But I've done it for smart meters, I've done it for wind farms, uh, I've done it for oil and gas rigs. It doesn't matter uh, what the protect surface is, I can put anything in a protect surface. So a PLC from Rockwell Automation, done that dozens of times. Very cool. And, and, and I guess when you, when you look at uh, zero trust, uh, there's a lot of interpretations of what zero trust means. You talked about it as a strategy. And we've seen publications from NIST, and, and I know you've done some recent work with NSTAC. You know, what, how do we find the, the authoritative answer as to what is zero trust? And where can we be looking? So we just, came, we just finished in February uh, the, and published the report uh, from NSTAC, which is a governmental organization that brings public and private uh, organizations together. And it had representatives from NIST, CISA, DISA, NSA, uh, DOD, and then private sector. And so that report, which is on CISA's website, is what I would consider to be authoritative. It contains the four design principles, the five steps, it has the Kipling Method policy uh, framework, it has the maturity model, and it has some examples in there. So if you really want to know what zero trust is without the vendor hype, go uh, look at the NSTAC Zero Trust Subcommittee report. I, I really enjoyed that matur maturity model element of it because it really did show how do we move into this, right? Not every device, not every, not everything has to have an identity. And, and you mentioned that zero trust is not identity. And I guess, Richard, you know, what, what is your view on how identity and zero trust work together? Well, it, it's been really interesting the last year and a half that um, I've had an opportunity to work with John because the, the, ide the identity solutions, identity uh, practice space of security um, has had tremendous amounts of challenges um, in workforce and customer access management. Um, and, and the reason that we've had tremendous amounts of challenges is because we really have had a difficult time defining identities within our systems, our networks, our processes, our transactions. You know, organizations um, literally have, you know, maybe 10% of their identities known within their uh, organizations and 90% are unknown. You've got developers that are creating, you know, accounts and passwords. You know, you have other developers that are creating accounts and passwords and entitlements and attributes. Um, and so it's a little bit, uh, you know, of the Wild West. And when I met John, um, and we started talking about, you know, identity and zero trust and its rightful role, this idea that identity is information that is consumed within the zero trust network, um, it was a really, uh, it was a eureka moment for me um, because I'm, I do a lot in identity. I'm fairly well known in that space. And I looked at John and said, I struggle with where identity fits within zero trust. Um, and he looked at me and he said, zero trust consumes identity. And at that point, it began to spawn a number of conversations with the, within the identity uh, solutions and identity uh, practitioners community around, well, if you really do understand the identity of a thing, um, you know, whether it is a human being or it is a device, whatever the case might be, um, you can begin to manage it. And it really falls in line with the, uh, the principles that are on the slide that are in front of everybody. All right, think about that 90% of identities that are undefined in almost everybody's organization here. Um, that is an infinite attack surface, right? It is, you don't have any guardrails around it. By understanding those identities and, and beginning to whittle them down, you begin to put controls around that attack surface, and it becomes a protect surface. And I think when we start to think about identity in security terms, 
which has been the biggest struggle for the last 30 years within the, within, uh, the corporate world, uh, because we love to talk about identity in an access administration function, but when we start to talk about it in true security terms, thinking about attack vectors, um, thinking about um, you know, the weaknesses that are inherent within unknown identities and entities, how we've ascribed you know, these identities to machines, devices, processes, flows, when we start to rethink that from a perspective of a zero trust framework, identity starts to make a whole lot of sense uh, in terms of where you need to focus attention to reduce risk within your organization. Yeah, any element in a digital environment can have an identity. And that's what some people call the identorata I don't want to believe, right? <laughs> they, only people can have identities. Well, there's no people on networks, right? It's an asserted identity, right? Yeah. So. People aren't packets, only packets are on networks. And so you can give any packet an identity and that's going to be the exciting thing of working in something like ICS because yeah. things that you didn't think could have identities only couldn't because you limited yourself to this human analog model and not the digital world that we're actually living in. When I, Tony, if I could jump on that real quick because I think that it's really important when I, when I start to have conversations about identity and its relationship within zero trust, especially with audiences like, uh, like we have today, um, this whole notion of identity ascription is, is new. It's, it's, a, it's a challenge sometimes for people to get a hold of, and it's because we, we talk about identities in the digital world as if they were the people, right? And in reality, you know, account assignments, identifiers, unique identifiers, anything that we ascribe uh, or we use to ascribe an identity is simply a proxy for an actor of some type within your system. So that actor might be human, right? That actor might be, you know, robotics. That actor might be, you know, a device. But identity ascription is a real thing, and I want people to understand how easy it is to make this logical leap and understand how identity ascription works. We've been doing it for thousands of years, right? A show of hands in the audience. How many of you have a dog? Okay, cool. How many of you have a dog with a dog name? Now, that's a rhetorical question because no one's going to raise their hand. Because the, the question I really want to ask is, how many of you have a dog with a human name? I see a lot of hands. Why do we ascribe a human identity to dogs? Right? This is actually a very important part of human civilization. We, we have to make complex constructs simple through abstraction. And identity ascription is exactly that type of abstraction that humans understand intuitively. And applying that intuitive understanding of identity ascription within your systems makes the idea of using identity within a zero trust framework a lot more palatable and actually a lot easier to execute. So, so you talked about this uh, coming in the future. How far away are we from being able to do those types of things? Well, from an identity ascription standpoint, we are there, right? It actually is very much like zero trust in that it requires a different type of thinking and pulling yourself out of, you know, layered models, pulling yourself out of defense in depth, pulling yourself out of, you know, any number of frameworks that we want to talk about um, that have come and gone or persisted, right? And when you look at the technology and tools that are available today, being able to define a set of you know, actors as a population and ascribe identity to, identity to them as achievable. Um, I actually left the more traditional workforce and customer access management um, identity space um, just within the past year, specifically to go focus on this problem. And uh, so the tech is here, the capabilities are here. The only impediment to actually deploying those technologies, um, and in my case, I'm working with you know, upwards of about uh, four dozen different customers on this, um, across all different industry segments, the only impediment is thinking differently about your architecture from a security standpoint and incorporating identity into uh, that equation within a zero trust framework. Just to pivot a little bit, I mean, just knowing the community we have here, we talk about ICS, we talk about OT, and, and John, a while back, you know, you wrote an article about you know, zero trust and 62443, you know, th right. those principles. Um, I, would you mind just elaborating a little bit on, on what you saw when you started to, to look at both of those and, and started to compare and contrast them? Well, when I was working at Palo Alto Networks, we were, all, we were mapping Purdue Model to Zero Trust to help people understand that. But of course, Purdue Model was created in the 
80s before we had any of this technology. And now we've got 62443, and I was working with uh, actually Accenture, the, uh, I don't know, not, not the guy who was on stage, but Accenture on this report because we could map 62443 to zero trust. So for example, a Kipling method policy, which is a concept in zero trust, who, what, when, where, why, and how, right? Rudyard Kipling gave us that idea in a poem in 1902. Who should have access via what application to where a particular resource via what criteria, how, that defines a conduit in 62443, for example, right? And so while there's a lot of process stuff around uh, 62443 in, this, in the security stuff, it fits actually very perfectly. And that's what we all kind of went, wow, that, that, that worked out w well serendipitously because we're, calling it, we're kind of all understanding the same problem. This is all about very granular policy allowing only specific users to access a specific resource at a specific time over a specific application for a specific reason, right? Instead of allowing everybody and playing whack-a-mole and trying to drop, you know, stop the bad stuff, just let the good stuff in. And so I tell people all the time, if something bad happens in your environment, you have a rule that allowed it. Right? All bad things happen in the allow rule. And I see socks spending a lot of time trying to figure out, oh, we, we denied something, let's investigate that. No, just give yourself a high five, you stop some bad stuff and start looking at what, what's happening inside the allow rule, because when we look at this, like this uh, data breach that where they were in there for nine months that came out a, a couple of weeks ago, there was a bunch of policies in place that allowed those attackers to go in and out all the time and nobody looking, right? And you don't do that in real life, right? When, when uh, th this man makes really cool tiki drinks. And if he has a tiki party uh, at, at his home bar and there's some guy sitting there that he doesn't know, he doesn't go, oh, well, I guess since he's able to come in here and sit at my bar, he belongs here. Hey, honey, can you make up the guest room? He's like, what the heck are you doing here? Only a few people get to come in and have tiki drinks with Richard Byrd. I'm not one of them yet, right? I need to, we need to adopt the, a new policy. But still, that's how we do it in real life. But in, 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 in our technological world, we're willing to let a lot of bad traffic come in because we're so fearful of stopping that one good thing. And we need to change that particular paradigm. And I think there's really, there's really a big opportunity there for us. Um, when, when you look at those similarities, look at the, the common concepts and core principles that, that really, um, again, complement one another, it's an opportunity for us to, I guess in this community, to help embrace that hype, if you will, right? I mean, zero trust as a strategy, as a term, um, is, a, is a hot topic right now with executives. We're seeing a lot of CISOs, a lot of companies, they're, they're being asked by their board of directors and, and whatnot, you know, what is our zero trust strategy? How are we going to get there? And I think from, from our community perspective, this is an opportunity to not maybe resist the, you know, that, that, that's not necessarily invented here type thing, but it, that uh, personifies or represents a lot of the things that we've been trying to accomplish. And it's, it's a way for us to, to gain momentum, align, and bring those concepts to bear as part of that holistic strategy. And we can make your job easier, and you're not gonna get a, ch a choice anymore, right? So. Uh, people will say to me, you can't do zero trust for OT. Well, why can't I? Why can't I apply this strategy to this, this technological problem? Uh, well, because that's not the way we've always done it. But things are changing. You have, you have executives uh, changing the incentive structure, and now you have legal uh, environments changing the incentive structure. So there was a hospital in New Jersey that did a whole bunch of bad things. And uh, health ins uh, or no, the state of New Jersey issued a consent decree. And part of the consent decree says that you must build a zero trust environment and listed some of the specifics that they must do. Now that has never happened, uh, you know, in my knowledge yet. I mean, we, you know, but a lawyer sent it to me. Look at this. There is a legal. Uh, consent decree, a legal document that says they have to do this. And so this is, a, this is a movement that is way bigger than I ever thought it would be, for sure. But jump on board and we'll make your life easier, man. <laughs> Ride the wave. Well, right. And I think that for this audience, so I, I spent a large part of my working career in the corporate world, uh, nearly 24 years. 
And about 16 or 17 of those years I spent in banking and financial services. However, when I became a chief information security officer, I became a chief information security officer in high-tech manufacturing. And um, I, I want to share a brief story. I, I, you know, you guys have great stories. I know it, it and I only have a few um, from my days working um, in, in high-tech um, analytical devices. Um, but one that stands out in particular as an example of how Zero Trust could really benefit this room full of people, um, specifically, because it, it, I had a situation here in Florida, actually, where I had a CNC water jet machine um, that every couple of months would all of a sudden, with Windows Embedded XP, unfortunately, um, all of a sudden start throwing bad email traffic, right? And that was getting us blacklisted on our domain. Um, and it was a Swiss company, and the Swiss were not really happy about that situation. Um, so we came down and actually did an on-site forensic, and we just couldn't figure it out. Why is this device somehow becoming you know, a, a deliverer of, of bad emails? Where is this happening? Um, so we checked every possibility in the network. We checked every possibility within our own systems. Still couldn't find it until one day we were standing on the floor in this on-site forensic, and uh, the gentleman that operated uh, that CNC machine lifted a thumb drive up off of the desk where he had been um, taking care of loading the next set of plans walked over, plucked it in the CNC machine, and all of a sudden it dawned on us to ask him where that thumb drive came from. And it came from his third grader, and it was infested. And every time he would go to change uh, those plans every uh, few weeks, then all of a sudden we would have the situation. Now think about this for just a second in the concept of, of zero trust. If I ascribed an identity to that device, one of the problems that we have in identity is we don't answer that important question within the Kipling method, which is why. Why should this device have access? Why should the CNC uh, machine have the ability uh, to have an attribute or an entitlement that allows it to send email? The answer is it should not. But we're not managing it in a way that allows us to both control and monitor activities that that device is doing that it should not be doing. And this is the point that I'll leave you with on, on how valuable as well as you know, how quickly you can adopt zero trust within your organizations. When we look at the OT, the IOT, the RPA space, everything that's built in that space is built for a purpose. It has a reason. Humans are infinitely variable. Devices and the things that we build are meant to be used for a specific purpose. So when that goes out of band and starts throwing bad email, we know that something has gone wrong within rules and policies because that's not what it's intended to do. So we can isolate in your communities, in your companies, and in your endeavors down to the why should this thing have access, give it the entitlements and grants that are associated to the identity, and drive improvements in your organization while reducing risk by an exponential factor. And let's take this example of how we could build a zero trust environment around it because this water jet CNC machine and its system becomes the protect surface, right? So even if somebody does plug in the, the malware drive yep. and it starts sending email, there is, a, there is some technology in front of that that says, oh, you're not supposed to be allowed to send email, I'm gonna stop that and alert that it's happening, and I'll give you some insight into what's happening, but the, it would never get the email out because we've reduced the yep. blast radius, you see? So it, things might be able to get in, but they can't get out. So if, if you take ransomware, for example, ransomware means that for at least three times you've allowed a malicious actor to come in and out of your environment to first drop the malware, then second set up the CNC control, and third do the symmetric key exchange, and probably a fourth step where they exfiltrated the data before they encrypted it. Uh, and you just allowed that to happen, and then you go, whoa, look at our machines encrypted. Well, if you would, were monitoring that, like the, 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 the step of monitor and maintain, and you had a policy that said, uh, you know, only these things can come in and out, and so suddenly a, a, a piece of software that is unknown tries to make a call to a server in the Ukraine that is unknown. Well, an unknown thing can't talk to an unknown thing by default, and you would stop it and be alerted, and you wouldn't have any damage to your system. But we have a lot, I talk to people all the time, do you have any unknown traffic on your network? 
Oh yeah, we have a lot of it. Well, in zero trust, you should have zero unknown traffic, right? Traffic should have identities to it as well, right? So CNC machine is easy. CNC machine, CNC machine one, CNC machine two. They're each a protect surface, or maybe you aggregate them, right? And then you have the CNC machine is controlled by a PLC, right? And the PLC has attributes. And so it has an application that it uses. And so we can know only that application should talk to that PLC. And so now we've reduced this problem down to a very small set. So the policy gets reduced 10 to, to well, seven to 10 times. So now it's a very small policy set that we can actually uh, audit and make sure that we know exactly what's going on. And so when auditors come in to audit that, which happens in these kinds of environments all the time, they go, oh yeah, I see what you're doing, great, excellent, uh, go forth and prosper. I, I think a big part of it is, you, you talked about the blast radius, but we also earlier mentioned in NSTAC the maturity model. And, and you, don't, you don't have to get to that point. And oftentimes we hear about, well, zero trust, you know, the first question that comes to mind is, you know, where do I put the PKI? And I, so going back to the, the maturity model and what you talked about, it's your, your blast radius improves over time. Right. Like the, you, you don't have to have it all perfect. You don't have to rip and replace all your devices with, and replace them with ones that support identity, right? It's, it's how do you start to work through the process and start to, to break it down and start to, to reduce that blast surface or blast radius, sorry, over time. And I, and I think that's a really big part. Like get started now, you know, leverage the concepts, and, and improve, yeah, the continuous improvement cycle. And, let, and let's talk about the PKI thing, because PKI, you know, I covered it at Forrester. Um, you know, it has some value, it has some problems, but do you have to have PKI to do identity anymore? No, no, and I think this is a really interesting question, because the, the truth of it is, is PKI and, you know, other, you know, other forms of, um, you know, containing identity uh, security issues exist because of what I said earlier. 90% um, of the identities inside of your organization are unknown, right? If you, if you actually have a very solid asset inventory, like I love companies that say, you know, our employees are our greatest asset. And then when you ask them, you know, what's your inventory of human beings? You know, how, what's your surety level? And they go, well, what do you mean? Like, well, what's your error rate? I mean, do you know 60% of the people in your company from a digital perspective? Or do you know zero, right? And when you, re when you get to a point where you have a strong body of knowledge within your organization about these identities, to be honest with you, PKI becomes irrelevant, right? Because a, a identity can only do what it is supposed to do based upon authentication, authorization, entitlement, and attributes. And, and therefore, if it's doing anything different, that's anomalous behavior, and you know that something's gone wrong. So, you know, I think that we're rapidly moving towards a world where things like PKI, which, as we've talked about, is a 20th century solution to a 21st century problem, um, are, are quickly going to get put aside by focusing on the architecture and making the architecture different to account for these unknowns. Yeah, I mean, X509 certificates work well for authenticating, say, a VPN system, mm -hmm. right? And you can push them to a device and all that kind of stuff. But how are you managing that certificate, right? Certificate management is poorly done. So whether it's a X509 certificate or an SSH uh, uh, key, mm -hmm. right? If we look at Snowden, no one did centralized SSH key ma management. He just set up putty, putty sessions and created his own SSH keys and then downloaded stuff and no one knew what he was downloaded via SSH because it was all encrypted, right? Yeah. So are you doing centralized key management for your PKI subsystem? Because there's no such thing as a PKI, it is a system, right? And so uh, do you know how many certificates you have? Because the answer is no, you don't. I mean, I'm sorry, the answer is you don't. You think you have 2,000, and when we, do, when we used to do audits, you'd have 16, 20,000, 100,000. Do you know when the expiry is done on them, right? Uh, what, what, what were we talking about today at lunch, uh, the expiry of uh, 000? Oh, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, Right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Never expires, because if it expired, it might be on my watch, and I could get in trouble, so I'll just make a certificate that doesn't expire, so therefore it's not very useful, because uh, you know anybody could 
uh, hack it, and now we see people hacking certificates, yeah. like in SolarWinds. Yeah. That was, I mean, sometimes what these hackers do, I just want to give them a round of applause. Yeah. That is awesome what you did. That's not even supposed to be possible, and they did it. Yeah. Right? Well, that's, and I know that we're coming up on time. We're, we're certainly going to be available uh, this evening as we uh, uh, go to the event um, after uh, the session. Um, and happy to talk about, actually, the Golden Samuel uh, exploit is uh, definitely worth talking about if anybody's interested in the mechanics behind that uh, that John just referenced. Um, but, Tony, thank you very much for having us. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you both. And I think it's an opportunity for all of us to, to flip the script on this leverage zero trust Right, let's, let's embrace the zero trust strategy, the messaging, and help us move the needle uh, on security in the ICS space. So thank you both very much. Thank you. Cheers to you. Thank you for coming.